This morning on Wake Up With Hope, Elizabeth Talbot from Jesus 101 will be having our devotional thought and we'll have a special season of prayer with our good friends from the Let's Pray team. Plus, the incredible journey will return to talk about death, the death that changed the course of history. Stay tuned. You're not going to want to miss a thing. Good morning and welcome to Wake Up With Hope. You know, we're so glad you have chosen to join us this morning. Yes, friends, we're so excited to be here waking up with a hope that can only be found in Jesus. And today we want to share that special hope with you. Mm. And today also happens to be National Artificial Intelligence Appreciation Day. Mm. <laughs> you know, you might find yourself on either side of the coin. Either you think that artificial intelligence or AI. Or AI is an amazing tool, or you you think it's gonna cause great damage or hurt to our world. Mm, well, friends, <laughs> no matter which side you lean on, we wanna encourage you to take hold of this day and learn more about AI before making any final decisions. Th that's right. <laughs> now it's time to begin our program by taking a look back at what took place on this day in history. On this day in history in 1995, Amazon officially launched as an online bookseller. Within a month, the fledgling retailer had shipped books to all 50 U.S. states and 45 countries. Founder Jeff Bezos' motto was get big fast, and Amazon, based in Seattle, eventually grew into an e-commerce giant. It now sells everything from groceries to furniture to live ladybugs, revolutionizing the way people shop. Amazon. I mean, who doesn't know about Amazon? It's almost a household name in America. And what an incredible story of small beginnings. You know, in Zechariah chapter 4, verse 10, it says, Do not despise these small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. Mm -hmm. You know, friend, no matter how modest your start or how big your dreams, mm -hmm trust that God is at work. He has a purpose for your life. And, and with faith and perseverance, he will guide you to achieve more than you could ever imagine. You know, like Amazon's journey from a small bookseller to an e-commerce giant, God can transform your efforts into something remarkable. Simply keep moving forward and making progress and seeking his guidance and his wisdom. And trust in his perfect timing and believe that he will Bless your efforts. Amen. So true. Well, this morning, let's talk about the one death that changed the course of history on today's episode of The Incredible Journey. Throughout history, there has been one thing that is common to everyone who has ever lived. Death. Some deaths have been more spectacular than others, some more notable and some more mysterious. Some changed the course of history and made a difference in the world, while most pass relatively unnoticed. Some stand out, either due to the life of the person or because of the way they died, or something to do with their funeral. For example, Alexander the Great had the most expensive funeral in history way back in 323 BC. He established the powerful Greek Empire that ruled much of the world. According to the ancient historian Diodorus, when Alexander died at the age of 33, he was placed in a solid gold sarcophagus, which was then placed in a solid gold casket, which was carried by a solid gold carriage pulled by 64 mules. It's estimated that the cost of Alexander's funeral exceeded half a billion dollars. Princess Diana's funeral was watched by more people than any other person in history up until that time. After she died in a car accident in Paris in 1997 at the age of 36, her funeral was massive, with people lining the streets of London to mourn. An estimated 2.5 billion people around the world tuned in to watch the live television broadcast of her funeral. James Doohan, had his ashes blasted into space. 
He was an actor in the television and film series Star Trek and had a lasting wish to travel in space. After he died, a small urn containing some of his ashes was flown into space aboard a rocket. Genghis Khan had the most violent funeral of all time. The Mongolian warlord, who brutally conquered much of Asia throughout his life, was almost as deadly in death. He wanted to be buried in an unknown and unmarked grave to prevent his enemies from desecrating his remains. So everyone who attended the funeral and everyone along the way, as well as all the soldiers in the funeral procession, were killed so that everyone who could have known where Khan was buried were now also dead. Jim Henson had a send-off from the Muppets. He was an artist who worked on Sesame Street, who created the Muppets. At his memorial service, the Muppets themselves made an appearance to ensure his funeral was a joyous affair, just as Henson wanted. Cian Anadurai had the most attended funeral ever. When the much-loved Indian politician died in 1969, 15 million people gathered for his funeral. It was one of the largest gatherings in history and the most attended funeral ever. These epic funerals remind us that no matter how remarkable, powerful, talented or popular a person may be, they will eventually pass away as well. They remind us that death comes to us all. However, the death and funeral that has impacted history and humanity more than any other was anything but epic in the popular sense of the word. There was no pomp or ceremony. There were no large crowds. In fact, it was a rather ordinary affair, attended by just a small group of close friends and secret admirers. But this death changed the world forever. It changed everything. It literally split history into B.C. and A.D. Every time you write a date, every time you celebrate your birthday, you're using the death of Jesus Christ as the focal point. And what makes the death of Jesus Christ so important is that it didn't last long. Just three days later, he was alive again. God raised him from the dead. The grave couldn't hold Jesus. His tomb is empty. Many believe that this rock-hewn garden tomb just outside the walls of Old Jerusalem is the authentic site where Christ's body was laid after his crucifixion. Whether it is or not, we may never know for sure. And you know, it doesn't really matter. What's important is that it reminds us that Christ's tomb is empty. He is risen. Can you imagine witnessing his death and then seeing Jesus walking around Jerusalem three days later? What an amazing thing. It was amazing back then and it's still amazing today. And here's why. The story of the resurrection isn't just Jesus' story. It's our story as well. You see, you are a part of the resurrection. Jesus' death and resurrection didn't just prove there is life after death. The resurrection proves you can have life after death and that there's life beyond the grave. Jesus says, if you believe in him and trust him, then death isn't the end. God made you to live forever. That's why you often have a feeling that there's more to life than just this. Jesus made an amazing promise in John chapter 11, verses 25 and 26. I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Now that's quite a promise. Jesus proved he could do it by resurrecting himself. He did it back then, and he can do it again for you. The Bible says, By His power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and He will raise us also. The great epic funerals of history remind us that death comes to us all. 
But the death of Jesus reminds us that in Him, life triumphs over death. As we remember and celebrate the resurrection this year, that's a truth to focus on and hang our lives on. If you trust Jesus, you will triumph over death and live forever too. And that's something worth celebrating. Our praying friends from the Let's Pray team are back this morning to lead us in a season of prayer. You know, God hears us when we pray. And friends, He wants us to pray and pour our hearts to Him. So let's pray. And the apostles, it says in Luke 17, 5 through 6, said to the Lord, increase our faith. So the Lord said, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say this to the mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea and it would obey you. Whoo! <laughs> Sometimes I think faith, I think I have faith, but then the mountain doesn't move and the mulberry tree is still sitting in place. And I wonder, what does the mustard seed of faith look like? But you know what? I'm so excited that we get a chance to pray about this and allow ourselves to be educated by our great teacher, our Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for teaching us about faith. I, I'm not a theologian, Jesus. I, I, I don't think I could pontificate as, as well as others, but Jesus, I know what it feels like to grab a hold of you. I know what it feels like, Jesus, to be in a situation where um, I can't even imagine something good coming out of it, but you're faithful. Your word says that you can't be anything but faithful because faithful is who you are. Oh, Jesus, if we could just get a tiny bit of that, the things that we could accomplish, Heavenly Father, would be miraculous. And so today, Lord, I pray that not only would you increase our faith, as some would say, but Father, that we would also begin to participate with the faith that you have given. I know, Jesus, that you are with us and that you are enabling us by the power of your Holy Spirit, Father. I pray also that you would clear out the things in our atmosphere and our minds and our emotions that are, that are clogging, that are blocking the way from us being able to hold on to the truth about who you are and who you say we are um, and that you are always making something beautiful, Jesus, even in the midst of the most difficult and horrific circumstances, Father. You are able you're able, Jesus. And I, I pray that even when we don't have faith in ourselves or faith in the people around us, Jesus, we have faith in you, that we would trust you inside others, Jesus, even when we can't see it. That we would trust you in our circumstances, Father, even when we don't understand it. That you would increase our faith, Father, as we choose to participate with you during these times of refining and strengthening and struggle. Your word also says in 1 Peter 5, 10, abbreviated, that after we have suffered a little while, there's that guarantee that the suffering will happen. After we have suffered a little while, you yourself will perfect. You yourself will perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle us. Heavenly Father, I thank you sounds like an increase in faith. It sounds like a fortifying. It sounds like a grounding, Heavenly Father, that happens when we have suffered. And I have a feeling, Jesus, and I ask that you would help each one of us today, right in the middle of our struggles, Jesus, to stop in the midst of the pain and the heartache that might be occurring in our lives, Jesus, and say, I don't understand, but I trust you so that, Father, that well of strength can be constructed, that scaffolding to support us can begin to be built because we've given everything to you, because in the midst of everything, we're pivoting to you, Jesus. Help us to turn to you and to stop in the middle of all of it and to say, we trust you, Lord. Increase our faith, Father. Give us just that mustard seed, Jesus, because when the next struggle comes, we'll be standing from that level of trust and faith and hope, Father. 
And that refining will take place and it will activate in us a strength that we didn't realize we had because of you, Lord. Because, Father, we allowed you to work in the place of our struggle for our future gain. And I thank you for that, Jesus. Please be with this community in each of the, the, the pain points, Lord. Meet them in the place of their need because we need you, Jesus. Every single one of us. Desperately, we can't even breathe without you, Lord. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for being with us and strengthening us right in the middle of these things. And Father, increasing our faith so that we can stand. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Hang in there. Hang in there. The Lord is with you and he sees you. And I just pray that you have a blessed rest of your day. Well, it's now time for us to take a short break, but when we return, we'll have today's devotional thought from Elizabeth Talbot of Jesus 101. And don't forget, if you're enjoying today's show, share it with a friend. Visit our website at hopetv.org slash wake up and subscribe to our YouTube channel to see more exciting content. Friends, we'll be right back. We are so glad that you've chosen Wake Up With Hope to start your day. Welcome back, friends. And as promised, this morning we have Elizabeth Talbot from our friends at Jesus 101, who will be sharing this morning's devotional thought. Hello there. We continue with our series, Fear Not. And today we are discussing an interesting fear, is fear not true discipleship. And the reason why we're talking about this is because some of us at some point in our lives were afraid of committing our lives to Jesus because we didn't know what was going to happen next. Uh, I was talking with a young man some time ago who said to me, I'm afraid of making a commitment to be a disciple of Jesus because I don't know what he's going to ask of me. Maybe he will ask me to leave my friends behind or, or just not have the same lifestyle. Or maybe he will ask me to do something big for him and I can't do it. Plus, I know I'm a sinful person. So how could I be a disciple of Jesus? Well, today we're going to discuss this because Jesus is going to do something for his disciples so that they will never be afraid of following him and do whatever he asked them to do. So let's go to Luke chapter five. He will show them there why they shouldn't be afraid of true discipleship. Luke chapter five is the actual call of the disciples to, to be his disciples, but he's gonna do it in a very interesting way. So let's get started in chapter five of Luke, starting on verse one. It happened that while the crowd was pressing around him and listening to the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. See, Jesus uh, is starting to uh, grow in reputation. So there are crowds that are pressing Jesus, they are following Jesus, they're listening to Jesus. And they're now by the lake of Gennesaret, which is the same uh, as the Sea of Galilee. It's just that Luke sometimes calls it Lake of Gennesaret. And he saw two boats lying at the edge, verse 2, of the lake, but the fishermen had gone, gotten out of them and were washing their nets. I don't know if you've ever seen uh, people take out the nets out of the water. We actually um, have seen fishermen uh, taking out the nets. And they take them out, they get the fish, they stretch the nets, they clean the nets, so when it says that they were washing their nets, it's actually saying that they are done. They, are, they have finished what they were going to do. And this is an important thing for what's coming up. So they're finished. Um, and uh, Jesus asks, he, he gets onto, into one of the boats that happened to um, belong to Simon on verse 3, Simon Peter. Um, he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put it out a little way from the land so that he could continue teaching. And it's interesting that Jesus is not just teaching in the synagogues, he's teaching in ordinary settings too. And he sat down and began teaching the people from the boat. So you can imagine this scene. Um, we have imagined it many times as, as, as we visited different sides of the Sea of Galilee. Um, Jesus there in the boat talking to the people that are on the shore. And when he had finished speaking, verse 4, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. So here I have some nets. <clears throat> uh, th th these were 
experienced fishermen. They knew when to put their nets down, when to take them out, and they were finished. And, and uh, Jesus says, oh, no, by the way, I know you're finished. I know you washed your net, but put it down again. Put it in, uh, into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon, a very experienced fisherman, thinks that these are absurd, absurd instructions. You know, he has already worked with his net, he's already clean, he's done, and he says it. He says it to Jesus. He says to him uh, on verse 5, Simon answered and said, Master, we worked hard all night. We know what we're doing. We're fishermen. You are a carpenter. You should stick to, <laughs> to your uh, profession. We are fishermen. He didn't say all that, but he said, Master, we have worked all, all night, and we worked hard and caught nothing. But, I, I like this word, but, or nevertheless, I will do as you say and let down the nets. You know, when you have worked hard in your marriage and it hasn't worked, and when you have worked hard letting go of an addiction and it hasn't worked, and when you have worked hard in getting rid of that anxiety that, that keeps you awake at night, and God says, let me do it. Just, just let me take over. There are times in which you got to stop trying and start trusting because your strength is not enough. Your, your, uh, the way you're doing things is not working, right? So every once in a while, Jesus will say, okay, let go and let God, <laughs> let me do it. And so, so Peter says, okay, but I will do as you say and let down the nets. So he lets down the nets. And can you imagine the surprise when he brings it back up? And it's so full of fish that, that it says that he has to call his companions and, say, and says, look at what's happening. Verse 6, when they had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish and their nets began to break. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat for them to come and help them. And they came and filled both of the boats and they began to sink. This is, this is like the confirmation of the, of the miracle, right? Not only did they catch a lot of fish, but the nets started breaking and then another boat came and then they filled up both boats and then the boats started sinking because there were so many fish. See, when they did it by themselves, they caught nothing. But Jesus was teaching them something and it was a lesson that they needed for the rest of their lives and it was this. Okay, let's continue and then I'll tell you what the lesson was. Verse 8, when Simon Peter saw that, he saw that his efforts had not brought any fish, but Jesus had brought this incredible quantity of fish. He fell down at Jesus' feet saying, go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. It's interesting, this paradox that he feels. He, he falls at Jesus' feet, but then he says, I'm so sinful, I shouldn't even be in your presence. Um, you know, many people in the Bible felt this when they got close to God. Abraham did, Job did, Isaiah did. They said, oh, I'm a sinful man. And I'm going to tell you a secret. The closer you get to God, the more sinful you will feel, feel. But you will live with both realities, the assurance that God is with you and that you have been saved by Him. And at the same time, that you are not the one that is making these things happen. That is all about God. So Jesus says, um, <laughs> don't fear, verse 10. Do not fear. From now on, you will be catching men. See, this was about Jesus. It was not about them. They left everything, says the next verse, 11, and they followed him. They, they left the, the nets, the fish, everything, and they followed him because they realized it was not about them. And if they were going to be true disciples, whatever God asked them to do, it would be by his power. That's why Jesus did this miracle at the beginning. Because what they were going to do for God and their life as a disciple of, of Jesus wasn't going to be because of their own power. It was going to be because of God's power. And I understand that sometimes we are afraid of committing. And Jesus says, you feel unworthy? You feel sinful? You feel like a failure? Follow me. Because this is not going to happen because of who you are, but because of who I am. Plus, if he asks you to do anything, don't forget that all his biddings are enablings. He will do it. It's not your power. It's his. Discipleship is following the one who has already saved you. He has done it by his power. The same way that he saved you at the cross through his blood is the same way that he will do whatever needs to be done in your life as a follower of Jesus. So fear not true discipleship. 
he invites you now to follow him and he will give purpose to your life. So take all those what ifs out of your mind and just follow him. Fear not true discipleship. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Those words were inspiring this morning. Well, friends, and thank you for watching Wake Up With Hope this morning. And if you'd like to learn more about our program or shares with a friend or even rewatch some part of today's program, please visit us at hopetv.org slash wake up. And don't forget to wake up with us tomorrow morning. We'll be here looking for you. We're going to have music by Chris James, an encouraging message from Pastor John Bradshaw. It is written, a delicious recipe from the Good Food Kitchen and so much more. And if you enjoyed today's devotional thought and you would like to learn more, visit hope.study to receive your free Bible study guides. Again, friends, that's hope.study to begin transforming your life today. And friends, that's all for today's program. But before we go, we want to leave you a Bible promise. And today it comes from 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. It says, but if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. Mm, and that's a promise. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much that your love is beyond measure. We, we can't even begin to truly and fully understand your amazing love. Thank you for giving us a clean and new heart when we don't deserve it. And we pray, Lord, that you would walk with us today. Keep us, keep us focused on you, Lord, as we choose to turn and set our eyes upon you. So thank you for filling us with hope today. In Jesus' name, amen.